everybody, Angel Arts here, and today uh, we have for you a very special episode. This video is the result of my uh, recent uh, Let's Talk contest, where I invited some of you viewers out there who are interested in talking about a very specific uh, subject that pertained to video games. Uh, some some specific topic that you thought would be really interesting for us to discuss and and to um, analyze and just 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 you know just hang out and just uh, really talk about our thoughts on a specific issue. And uh, one of the people who won this contest is a viewer named Shen. You're gonna have to remind me how to pronounce your name again, Shen. <laughs> Chen Rai Earnest, yeah. more or less. You you gotten it more or less right in the past, so it's Chen Rai Earnest or Shen Chen Rai, etc. Jonathan. I I, I just call him Chen <laughs> or Jonathan. <laughs> Perfectly fine. Uh, everyone I know has. So no problem. Here. Um. So well, what I'm gonna start uh, I'm gonna start things off by letting Shen himself explain to all of you what his specific topic was and why this topic is passionate to him. So go ahead and take it away, Jonathan. Okay. Well, my topic, which won the contest, yay, was um, romantic diversity in video games, mm -hmm. um, which I think, personally, is a really interesting topic. I hope you all agree, because um, it's very broad and encompasses a lot of the different aspects that go into the, I suppose you'd call human element of a video game. And in particular, um, your interaction with characters who obviously are not real, but still feel very well, real as people and such. Um, it involves diversity in many different forms, um, such as race, um, creed, whatsoever, mm -hmm. etc. And um, also a very pertinent topic to Angel Art Stone Channel and to many of us who love Bioware games and such, um, romance and the entire um, establishment of romance as a mechanic in video games. And when you put those two together, it really gets into what I believe an interesting um, combination and an interesting exploration of some of the topics of diversity and romance um, that allow you to really explore them in a very great depth and in a very personal way, I'd like to think. Mm. Um, so basically, um, one of the reasons I'm really passionate about it is because you are able to explore such interesting character dynamics, um, some very um, cool relationship aspects that you wouldn't necessarily get just from going outside and talking to people, you know, whatever. Um, and, and because it's just, in general, a great way of allowing more diversity and more of the human element into a medium that is not always great about it, um, and which still has some growing up to do, but is making drives through things such as this. So awesome! I'm, and I hope you all will be too. It's definitely great to have you, Shen. I'm very honored to discuss this with you. It should be a, it should be a good time. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, with Shen's permission, we uh, have a guest who will be joining us during this discussion as well. This is Kath Leenums, who is not only one of um, my favorite YouTubers, she's also uh, has become a very good friend to me as well. Someone that I definitely uh, very much respect a lot. Um, and uh, I'll just let her give a brief overview of her channel and why she is very passionate about this subject as well. Go ahead, Kathleen. Hi, I'm Kathleen Ums, and I'm really excited to join this discussion. I'm so glad you guys invited me to be this in this discussion because this is one of my favorite topics to talk about. Um, I think it's really important to have characters that people can look up to in games, um, especially because video games, you usually have these like heroic type characters that you can look up to. And like I know one thing that I've talked about in my Let's Plays and my own videos on diversity is that it's been so powerful to have other lesbian characters to look up mm -hmm. to in video games. And I think that's why um, romantic diversity is so important in games, so that like people of all um, orientations can have someone else to look up to, someone else to admire. Um, so, But I think that's maybe one of the things we'll explore in this uh, discussion. Great. Thank you, Kathleen. So just to help us give ourselves a little bit of structure, uh, we've got, we've sort of have 
um, made a loose outline um, that is just going to be a bit of a guide as we go through this. Uh, I think what we decided to do was we were going to start by talking about romances in video games in general, uh, followed by diversity in video games, and then move on to romantic diversity in video games. So, Shen, it's your subject, so I'll let you, you know, kick things off with the with first uh, topic or subject that you want us to, to talk about or discuss. Uh, certainly. Um, well, just starting off, uh, certainly... I think we can agree that um, romances and video games are very, are pretty popular nowadays. Mm -hmm. um, are rather prevalent, not in all aspects, partially because, of course, it's not necessarily a mechanic that will make sense in every game that comes around, even though people are trying it different ways all the time. Um, but it's it's very very prevalent to where it does it has started to um, peek into genres and um, formats that might not have been thought of before. Mm -hmm. um, one, of, one of my, uh, I guess, uh, go-to examples of how far um, the topic of interactive romance has come is um, that uh, in Sonic Chronicles, a game that, not surprisingly, um, was made by Bioware, we'll be mentioning Bioware a lot, and <laughs> um, actually has, <laughs> indeed, a romance option in, of all things, a Sonic game. Um, again, by Bioware, but it's, um, it's very interesting. Um, and of course, does not involve what it tends to in the more adult-oriented one. Mm -hmm. But so it's it's really starting to um, wrap around, for better or worse, depending on how you feel about it, to a whole lot of different um, genres and facets of the video game community. And people are starting to ask for it more and more. I'm sure anyone who's been on any forums will attest to that. Um, again, whether they like it or not, um, and certainly developers are starting to feel a lot of the. Um, a lot of this way that our good romance can have for getting an audience for a video game. Be um, be the point where Final Fantasies and just all sorts of Eastern games, I mean, you've got dating sims that have, mm -hmm. that have become such a huge format. Um, all of this, all over the world in all sorts of different permutations, you find that romance and such deep character interaction as it is just becomes a lot more prevalent as time goes on um, for a lot of different reasons. Before we continue on, uh, I just wanted to make sure that I put in the disclaimer that because of the specific topic, we may delve into spoilers of specific video games. So just use your discretion knowing that when we're going to be discussing all of these different games, that um, certain there might be certain spoilers that might pop up. So anyway. And I'll try to warn beforehand and whatnot, because I know that there's some spoilers that you all might not necessarily right. want to be spoiled on either. Um, but I'll try to uh, I'll try to cover that if I can. Video games with romances is something that I think uh, was never. I, I think it was it was something that was brought into video games very gradually, just because mm -hmm. when you started having video games that actually had stories in it, um, most. I think most stories in all media, whether it's movies, whether it's uh, in books, they tend to have some sort of a romantic arc in many of them. And so naturally, when more and more video games started having uh, more story elements in it, I, I can definitely see why uh, the writers of these stories decided to put in these romantic elements. I think where it started to get a little bit more interesting and sometimes even controversial is is how deeply these romances uh, ended up being, especially in role-playing games where you're actually playing a character that could romance uh, another character who's not real, who is a completely made-up, you know, figment, not figment of imagination, but completely made-up character. Uh, and it's just, uh, I always thought it was really interesting how when that first started to happen, people started reacting to these romances, um, did you guys did you guys remember the first time, for example, when uh, Mass Effect uh, came out and there was this big controversy? I think on the news about the love scene 
And I remember that, uh, I think it was my Fox, surprise, surprise. A, a new role-playing video game that is leaving nothing to the imagination. Mass Effect is what it's called. Uh, it's made for Microsoft's Xbox system, and it features some, in some parts of this, you'll see full uh, digital nudity. Imagine. And the ability for the players to engage in graphic sex and the, the person who's playing the game gets to decide exactly what's going to happen between the two people, if you know what I mean. Let's, let's talk about who the video game is for. It might be for adults, but if you look at the t statistics, who is playing video games but adolescent males, not their dads. And here's how they're seeing women. They're seeing them as these, as these objects of desire, as these, you know, hot bodies. I mean, they don't, they don't show women as being valued for anything other than their sexuality. And it's a man in this game deciding Hi. how many women he he wants to be with. Cooper, have you ever played Mass Effect? No. And it doesn't force you down in any situation. You can actually play through this game without the sexual situation ever happening. Right, and the young the boys game. are going to be choosing not to have sex. That'll be what they'll choose. And the research says there's a new study out of University of Maryland right now that says that boys that play video games cannot tell the difference between what they're seeing in a video game in the All real right, world if they don't have a real experience. Who can argue, possibly, that, uh, you know, Luke Skywalker meets Debbie Does Dallas is a good thing. It's not. It's just not good. And I'm definitely yeah. not going to let uh, Mass Effect in my house. Uh, it was kind of ridiculous. And eventually they did, um, thankfully, yeah. apologize. And he, that they, they really didn't know what they were talking about. Um, but, I mean, certainly that was a big milestone yeah. um, in a lot of ways. And, of course, that has more to it than just it being um, vaguely sexual. It was... Um, it was just very new because I, I think that was the problem. It was just something very new to them and very foreign to them because I think there was already at the time a very negative stigma or, or has been a negative stigma for people who didn't grow up in our generation when we had, you know, more and more video games, the, the, the surplus of video games that happened since, you know, the Atari and Nintendo days. And just the thought that you had this medium that was interactive where you could be romantically involved with someone uh, even though I think the reporter admitted herself that she never played the game, and yet she seemed to be a huge expert on the pornographic images that occurred in this game, even though I've seen worse on <laughs> on daytime. daytime television and soap operas. Much yeah. So, go ahead, Kathleen. Did you have something to say? Well, I think I think Jonathan said like a really interesting p part. A really interesting thing a while ago um, about the fact that not all romances and games are necessarily adult mm -hmm. romances. Um, I remember there being romance in games as long as I've been playing games. I know I played Shenmue when I was really little, and uh, that was there was a romantic interest in that game for the main character. Um, it was just it was very subtle. It wasn't very right. in your face, um, but there was a romance kind of in the background, and it wasn't an adult romance. And Final Fantasy games, there's often romance. I mean, Final Fantasy X, there was a romance exactly. in that game. Um, I think the new generation. I think one thing that like the generation before us doesn't quite un didn't quite understand is that just kind of like kind of like the Harry Potter books, mm -hmm. like it, they got more mature as yeah. the generation that grew up reading them got more mature because they were for the that generation that that um read them as they were kids, and I think that's just how video games have developed as well. Mm -hmm. um, they've kind of grown up with the generation that's been used to growing to playing okay. video games. Yeah. You know? Um, so yeah. yeah. Not they've... so much in other ways. Yeah, not not so much in other ways. But um, yeah, they we'll so get... it, it made sense to me that it would get more mature in content because the target audience is still like uh, uh, in many ways the audience that was targeted when they when we were children. Right. So and now we've grown yeah. up and yeah. games have been evolving. So many more people, I mean, I remember, you're right, back when I was a little kid, it was pretty rare, unheard of for anyone over 30 or 40 to be playing video games. And now that's just not the case anymore. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we had, like you said, Kathleen, there were definitely aspects of romance, even like in Mario game, you've got Super Mario and Peach, even back in the Donkey Kong areas, you know, Pauline yeah. was, you know, Mario's girl at the time. And then he dumped her for somebody with a bigger <laughs> castle. But um and like in the arcade games there would be um a like little heart yes. after you finished a level. Exactly. Like because he you know, get, get the girl. A lot of it. <laughs> I don't know what 
Um, yeah, a lot of video game stories is about like rescuing your loved one, like Double Dragon, Billy's girlfriend, or Lee, whatever Billy or Jimmy's girlfriend. You have to go save. So, romance. I think I think uh, what previous generation just didn't understand is romance has always been in video games. It's just now that they've become a little bit deeper and dare I say more interactive. It's it and interactive is is the word for it. I think it's really interesting saying earlier that I mean part of how they've grown so much, the romances and video games, is that more and more they are becoming interactive. And of course that's setting some people off and also causing certain, um, I guess you could say, rifts in, well, you know, um, fandoms and communities. Certainly, I mean, if you if you know a lot of the Dragon Age and Mass Effect, in general, Bioware community, some of them have very strong feelings about how they play the game and, how, and have strong feelings against how other people play it. I mean, it almost gets ridiculous some of the time. But, um, I mean, a huge sign of, it, of the game industry in general growing up has whenever they have the start of becoming less um, goals to achieve through the main story, mm-hmm. but they started optional, they started to become more interactive, they started to get to the point where you can win the game itself, but you can't necessarily win who you want. Mm. Um, and all that has just, in a way, gotten to the point where it makes it more realistic to some certain degree. Yeah. Um, more, but... It's just gotten more realistic over time and just, in general, yes, deeper, um, certainly. Jonathan, I think you've done some research, and and do you know uh, some of the origins of romances in video games? Like, and I mean, like, deeper than just, you know, Super Mario rescuing the princess. Absolutely. Um, Romance, as we sort of more or less know nowadays, um, it's still, it started not terribly long ago, um, but towards the beginning of um, video games and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And I will also a uh, disclaimer that, um, okay, I'll be honest, a lot of this information I got from, say, TV tropes or something like that. I'm a huge TV troper, so I got a lot of information from there. So not all of it's necessarily going to be accurate. I tried the best I could with sure. the research that's the most objective. You know, there's a lot of he, he said and she said when it comes to um, certain practices and what they did back in the day or something like that. But um, in general, I try to be as factual as I can about this. Mm-hmm. Um, the actual topic, um, I think, um, and this is one thing that TV Tropes um, named, and I guess it's sort of relevant, but I think the first um, real conscious use of Romance, I guess, as a goal and also as being more or less optional mm-hmm. was a game um, back in 1991, I believe, mm-hmm. called It was a part of a larger series, but Dragon I Knight? wouldn't necessarily... Dragon Knight. Uh, you know, what system? Do you remember what, do you know what system that's in? Um, admittedly, no. I actually did not um, okay. write that down. But, I mean, it's, it should be pretty easy enough to find, except that you may more or less not want to because it was actually a pornographic game. Believe it or not. Oh. So they're very, they are extremely sexual games. I mean, you know, the, the early era, whenever games were very heavy on the on the sleeves and whatnot to draw attention and stuff like that. And of course, like, you know, Japanese. Are, are, sorry to interrupt. Are we talking like Witcher pornographic or like pornographic pornographic? Like Eroge, Hentai, that kind oh, okay. of thing. Okay. So, Got it. And of course, it was, I <laughs> mean, yeah. That like, that should tell you, that should give you an idea. So not necessarily recommended for, you know, everyone. Um, other than the fact that it's actually a very hilarious game. I read a Let's Play on a forum, and they they uh, localized it to be very, very humorous and self-aware and breaking the fourth wall everywhere. So it's funny in that sense, but, you know, obviously it's not for everyone. Um, but it's, even though it was a very sexual game, I think uh, a lot of people consider it, to, well, I don't know. Uh, it's considered to have... Um, nuances of what romance would come to be, you know, you would have to do certain things to get certain girls. Um, it, it could be possible to miss certain girls. It could be possible not to, um, just to not do the right thing, possibly. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly no expert on this game for one mm-hmm. reason or another. Um, but I think that's probably considered to be one of the earlier examples. Um, as for after that, I think the first real um, the first real example of romance as we are starting to see more now in the modern era mm-hmm. was actually a gold box game, which was a series of um, Dungeons & Dragons RPGs based off, I believe, the first or second edition okay. of Dungeons & Dragons. 
back in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. And the first um, game that really sort of started to, to eat towards this was um, in 1992 called Treasures of the Savage Frontier, hmm. um, which is a really fascinating um, example, actually, because it includes a few things that a lot of games nowadays don't do with the topic. Because in terms of story content, um, I mean, Dungeons and Dragons is as story-based as you want it to be, or otherwise. Um, it may not have been heavy on the story content, and certainly the romance was not really heavy on the story content. There was a little bit um, thrown in there for flavor and whatnot, but really what the romance really did is, A, it was exclusively heterosexual, obviously, um, and you could have any one of your um, player-created party, um, it was a player-created party, everyone um, could be created by the player to have whatever specification oh, okay. they wanted. Mm -hmm. Um, someone um, in the player party could fall in love with um, an opposite sex um, uh, recruited party member who they come across. And what's interesting is that that if those two members of the party end up being in this party together, they will fight better. Huh. And in addition to that, yeah, were you going to say something hard? No, I'm just, I, I just thought that was interesting. Go ahead, yeah. keep going. Um, yeah, it is interesting because, you know, actually a lot of games don't do it that way. I mean, it's a very gamey way of doing it, which is probably the reason. But it's it's certainly for being one of the first um, instances that we see of it. It was it was very different, um, and certainly I think got a lot of people interested in the topic. Maybe um, mm. and not only did they fight better and together in combat. Apparently, if one of the um, one of the lovers, so to speak, died while in combat, the other would go into basically a berserk state. I mean, they would basically get angry that their lover just died and would like fight like crazy until the end of the battle. I mean, so it's actually surprisingly nuanced for back then, at the very least, when it comes to, I guess you'd call it the infancy of real romance in a video game. That's um, And as for the story content, um, sorry, as for the story content, it, it also came down to um, one particular cutscene, I believe, where um, the party, um, so, for somehow, I'm not really sure how this was played out since the party is supposed to be player-controlled, but um, the love interest and the party member will stand up in front of the campfire at some point and ask the permission of the party to um, bless their um, relationship. And apparently the party was actually able to say no and mm. would completely like, ruin the battle efficacy of the two party members. So mm. it was a surprisingly thought-out system mm. um, for the time. So it was very interesting for that reason. And not a lot of games do it that way. Not to say they should, but... It was definitely interesting for being such Yeah, I that's that is a really interesting uh, game mechanic, and I I'm honestly not really sure what my opinion of it would be yet, uh, because it sounds like an interesting and it makes sense too. You know, having your companion with you, a morale boost, and having that actually be a combat advantage in the game. I just question whether or not. Uh, people who had played the game uh, decided to seek a romance for their character because of the romance for romance's sake or because they just wanted to be able to fight better like you know as, as probably not I mean again it was a very gamey way of doing it there wasn't a lot of story content to go along with it now if someone were to do it that way with story content that might actually be very successful but to my knowledge it hasn't really been done to quite that capacity so it's just it's interesting it it's sounds very it sounds very similar to the approval system in some of the Bioware games yeah. where if a, if a character likes you, then they have certain benefits. Or even in, like, say, Dragon Age 2, if you're in a rivalry with them, they have other benefits as well. So it sounds like an approval rating system, even though it's not just your romantic interest, but it's also the rest of the party. Were you going to say something, Kathleen? In Dragon Age, like, I'm not completely familiar with Dragon Age, but in the second game, you can have, like, an angry relationship, yes. right? Right, that was the yeah. rivalry. Right. The rivalry, yes. <laughs> yes. But in this case, they'd be angry at each other and not so much the enemy, so... I mean, I guess... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this was... I mean, but yeah, it was interesting. I, I certainly think it would have been interesting playing that for the first time, not really knowing what there was about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a very interesting, if archaic example... Huh, gotcha. And then um, after that, and I mean, circa maybe 1994, um, the year of my birth, incidentally enough, <laughs> um, uh, yeah. um, dating sims, I think, started to become a really big thing. Um, I didn't put down the name of the particular dating sim that's, that I think really started. I think it was Toka in a uh, hospital or something like that. Mm. Um, but um, those started um, over in the East in Japan and whatnot to become very popular. And, of course, that eventually 
um, uh, trickle down over to here. Um, and then, as far as the West goes, probably um, I think the biggest um, use of it back then, and what probably I would say defined it for the rest of you know gaming history, uh, as romance goes, is um, a side quest in Baldur's Gate: The Tale of the Tales of the Sword of Coast mm -hmm. expansion. Again, I I mean just as a disclaimer, I haven't played any of these, so all of this is research based, mm -hmm. but. Um, Apparently, yeah. Apparently, um, though the original Baldur's Gate, um, the original version of that, did not have any romance whatsoever. Mm. They added in as a side quest in Tales of the Sword Coast, um, the expansion, gotcha. and people apparently really liked it. And there was there were certain gameplay uh, um, advantages to it too, but it was much more um, story based. I feel um, like, than any sport. I feel like Baldur's Gate was that necessarily Bioware's first game, or or first, I guess, well known game. Uh, I mean, it was Bioware, but I don't know if I would say it was well known. But it was. At, it looks like the first game to have mm -hmm. romance, but we it took capacity that we know of nowadays. I mean, it wasn't with a party member, mm -hmm. so I guess that, you know, that's that. But it was it was optional, and it had apparently a lot of the trappings that modern romances and video games do have. So I would, you know, I guess you could probably argue that it was sort of the grandfather of what we consider romance nowadays. Well, I kind of want to hear what you guys think about, I think it's it's kind of hard to talk about dating sims and not talk about the controversy, mm -hmm. um, especially because, like, yeah. because they started in Japan, there is a lot of controversy in Japan about dating sims, um, especially because the birth rate has plummeted in Japan. Mm. Um, there's a lot of, like, children's hospitals, schools have been shutting down just because very few people are having children, very few people want to be in relationships, huh. so I think that's partially why it's so controversial wow. that um, a lot of men are kind of going to dating sims and not really being in real relationships. So hmm. I'd love to, I, I, I think that's more of like the Japanese kind of controversy with it. But um, I mean, they have like words for that, like the whole otaku kind of culture where it's kind of like the stereotype of like the Japanese guy that doesn't have a girlfriend but has like a dating yeah. sim girlfriend and or like gets married to a, to a fictional character or something like yeah. that. Yeah, and so um, what do you guys think about that controversy? Does that, I mean, obviously... I've heard about that. That's interesting. Yeah. For people like me who are who are not as educated on the topic, uh, with dating sims, and I guess the answer is there's just many different types of them, but are, are dating yeah. sims more of a of a sexual fantasy kind of simulation, or is it you actually have a character that has a personality that you are, you know, wooing. It's not just sex. It's actually like you're actually forming some sort of virtual relationship with this character. It's very. Um, usually dating sims that go much more towards the sexual side are what Dragon Knight was. Um, mm -hmm. They're considered anti. Um, just a general adult content games like that. They exist, and sometimes they're called dating sims, mm -hmm. maybe by people. But a lot of dating sims tend to be at least more pure, maybe I guess you could say, in their intention. You, okay. you know, it's it does gamify the romance, but it's still a wow sport. I mean, you still get story content out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the emphasis is put on the relationship. However well written or, I guess, you know, more than one dimensional the relationship is, it's, you know, there's, there, there's some... There's some relationship aspect to it, however far they intend to take the other end of it. I mean, so in general, it tends to be based around, yes, like love and, mm -hmm. you know, just whole affection in a virtual form, as mm -hmm. it were. Do you think that there could be benefits for this, like for dating sims? Like, I wonder if, even though it has a lot of controversy, that maybe it could be a valuable tool for, like, people that don't have... Um, very strong social skills. Yeah. Maybe it could be a good way for them to develop those social skills. And also, maybe it's just a fun way to like have an imaginary life yeah. and take time off of your everyday life. Right. You know, like that's kind of why I enjoy romances and games every once in a while. I mean, I've never done a like, dating sim, but kind of always wanted to hear a positive kind of idea of it. Yeah. Oh. Because I ah. only I only ever hear negative things about it. That's why I kind of asked. Like, yeah. I, I tend to think that dating sims are relatively harmless, and I mean that both in a good way and a bad way, I guess, because, um, I mean, you see a lot of fan-made dating sims and whatnot, and, you know, a lot of the more, I guess you could call them AAA ones, go into a lot more depth than maybe ones that are made by fans and whatnot, but dating sims tend to be a much more 
gamey and have a much more gamey feel mm -hmm. than say something that we have over here in the West. And, you know, maybe part of that is you know speaking as personal preference or whatnot. But I mean, there are a lot of dating sims that are more or less. You pick. You have a choice of two options to pick. And if you pick one that sounds like it makes sense, it may not be the right one. And then you get the options again, and that time you have to select the correct one. It's, so it's a little, it, it, it's hard to really get into them, at least from my experience. And again, my experience is a little bit, is a little bit um, limited. Um, I mean, I have played a few that I've liked and whatnot. I've, I've gotten around to that, too. Um, but I guess, I don't know if I would say they're necessarily better for interaction than, say, what we have over here in the West, which are more westernized RPGs with more, with, with what try to be more detailed and nuanced um, romantic content. Um, I mean, again, maybe if it just comes down to personal preference, it's probably pretty mm -hmm. objective, um, but I guess that's just the way I feel about it. Speaking from personal experience, don't worry, I'm not going there. Um, it's not. It's not what you think. It's, um, growing up, growing up, especially through middle school and high school, I've always been a hopeless romantic, very big hopeless romantic. And growing up as a gay male, um, I, you know, it, it took a while for me to come out. And I was always the kind of person who envisioned myself to have a very stable, monogamous relationship with somebody, having, you know, the the full shebang of having the, the son and the daughter and the dog and the cat and the picket fence kind of thing. And um, my f yeah. my first, I guess my first, um, one of my favorite games when it first came out in, in early college and late high school was The Sims. Because I had never before that experienced a video game where I could actually play as a gay character. And not only play as a gay character, but it could actually like have an... A, 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 you know, in my eyes, a stable monogamous relationship with someone and actually have children and actually have something that I hadn't already envisioned myself because there was a period of time in my life, especially before I came out, where I just felt like I would never have that. I didn't think that I would ever, if you know, I wasn't sure if I would even come out ever. And uh, there was a time where I wanted to know what it would feel like even if it wasn't real, just like in my own little fantasy, what it would feel like to actually go through the process of finding somebody that I liked and the feeling I would have with something that I liked. And uh, I think that um, with The Sims, it was a pretty healthy experience because it allowed me to live vicariously through a character that I made um, and actually be able to uh, experience something that at the time I wasn't sure I would ever experience. Um, and I guess... You know, there's always the danger of yourself getting lost in a fantasy. I mean, you have to understand, as an adult, you have to understand, you know, none of this is real. This is all just, you know, something as an escape, you know, um, which is why uh, when I, when you know, I moved on to other games like Bioware and I started playing Dragon Age Origins and I got to meet um, Alistair, who I instantly fell in love with, but he was straight. But he was straight, and that was like, oh. Um, but I mean, just the but, which is why I ended up creating a female character, and I was able to live vicariously with that female character. Um, but uh, yeah, I, 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 I think that I don't. I mean, I don't judge people based on as long as they're not hurting anybody, and you know, whatever they do in their own time when it comes, you know, in order to experience whatever it is they want to experience and not have it bother anybody else uh i try not to judge personally so i think it's cool that we brought this topic up even if it's in the vein of dating sims because of course this is something that can be said for any kind of yeah. video game or any kind of medium that involves you getting really connected with right um characters especially romantically you know that has a lot of weight um, in our psyche potentially if we allow it to. And, and you know, and it's pertinent. Um, I mean, you get people who sit there and say, well, why are you getting so invested in yeah. things that aren't real, people that aren't real and whatnot. And, I mean, that's for a number of reasons. You really couldn't count all the reasons individually that people really enjoy stuff like that. Um, yeah. I mean, certainly. I mean, I will say again that maybe dating Sims as they are. It's funny that you actually bring up the Sims because the Sims, um, at least you know, maybe the first or the second one, had sort of a dating sim kind of feel to them because you could make meaning out of it, which is one right. of the great things about 
for it. You can make meaning out of something that really doesn't have much. Right. You can make meaning out of it, but for the most part, it's still very gamey and whatnot. Yeah. But and that's fine. Um, I mean, it's, it's kind of funny you just brought that up, but um, I mean, The Sims definitely does a better job um, than a lot of dating sims that I've played. At any rate. Uh, yeah. So, Kath- it depend on the kind of game. Kathleen, what are your opinions? I, well, I just, I mean, I don't want you to think I'm hating on dating sins. I just kind of wanted to bring up the controversy a little bit. Um, but yeah. I really like what you said, Hark. Um, I didn't even realize that. Like, I had gay romances when I played The Sims as a kid, and I always kind of made sure that I had my earphones in and that my parents couldn't see because I didn't want them, like, yes. thinking anything, <laughs> yeah, you know? Yeah, exactly. Um, but I, once I found out that, like, women could romance each other in The Sims or that you could have, like, married couples exactly. in The Sims, mm-hmm. I was just like, yes, like, this happened. Because, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. like, I don't run into, like, I don't know, it's not very often that you'll run into, like, gay couples in my town, so, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, like, like t- today I, you know, saw people wearing, carrying around Confederate flags, like, walking down the street, and yeah. I'm like, okay, you know, this is the town that I live in, um, so... I just, I, but that's the great thing about games is it kind of, like, opens your eyes to the way things are, kind of, Yeah. you know, and and if, especially if you live, like, in a different country and you're totally not used to that, it's, like, kind of refreshing, too. And, I mean, it doesn't even have to have anything to do with, you know, with, with sexual, with, you know, sexual diversity. I mean, anyone can, as a perfectly straight person, can play The Sims and, you know, live vicariously through someone who's dating, like, Ryan Gosling or with, yeah. you know, with um, you know, uh, whoever other celebrity or even, uh, like, a character from a book that they read or a movie that they've watched. I mean, it's just... It's, oh, yeah, I love doing that. Yeah, I mean, it's... it's I mean, it's, yeah, it's innocent pro- fun. I built an opera house when I was in, like... <laughs> <laughs> and had, like, the fan of the opera and everything. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I think one of the things that Kathleen suggested about, you know, someone who might have, who might lack some social skills may benefit from something like a, a, a simulation, especially if you have characters that uh, act as much as possible like real people. Because uh, I guess for people who um, do have difficulty, if they like somebody, but they're just too shy to approach someone, uh, it might... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it might be helpful to, I guess, practice <laughs> with a video game because the repercussions are so, like, so, I mean, so little. I mean, if you really fail, if you end up saying the wrong thing to Morrigan or Leliana, for example, or Liara, you can just, you know, load and try again yeah. and just, you know, just the whole, I, I mean, it, it definitely helps uh, with the concept of, you know, the real life concepts of all these people are different, specific, different people like different things. There are definitely things that you might say that offends one person and might not, and uh, to what it might offend another person, but another person might find endearing or charming. Um, you know, it's, I guess if, um, they see it more like a game that might bring them more into their own, into more of a comfort, more of their comfort zone. So that in real life, if they go in, and they motivate themselves to finally approach that girl thinking that, okay, it's just a game. And, you know, if she turns me down, it's all right. I'll just, you know, keep trying again with the next girl, you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, but multiple ways you can look at it, um, certainly. But, yes, in general, it's, it can be good for some. Yeah. Just period. Yeah, I think that's it's kind of a really important lesson I think games kind of need to tell a little more it, that there are consequences to relationships. Oh, definitely. Yes. I think it can be dangerous when you kind of have every female character, or every character in general, just like a cl- button click away from yeah. a sex scene. Because yeah. I mean, that's what's something that's gotten a lot better yeah. on, too. And, you know, yeah. Because, like, I mean, in real life, there are serious consequences <laughs> for treating people as though they're button click away from a sex right. scene, you know? Um, but I think that's that's an interesting thing you brought up that, like, you know, learning to deal with rejection is a really powerful thing. Yeah. And um, I think that's one thing, like, you know, before I, I came out, I actually I broke a couple guys' hearts, and it really sucked. Um, but one thing, like, I, that always kind of made me sad is when, like, a guy would, like, just kind of give up after... You know, 
um, trying once, um, and I think that's that's one thing that like you, you that's a valuable skill to learn in like the dating world is like you know you may have just hit on a lesbian yes. and you know you you're gonna hear a yes eventually once you don't hit on a lesbian. <laughs> I, I, when you were talking, Kathleen, about how video games, relationships and romances of video games can help you cope with things like rejection, I couldn't help but think about the short end of the stick that is Fem Shep's relationships in Mass Effect 3. Uh, uh, I'm yeah. referring to one, Jacob Taylor, and in a way, <laughs> in a way, Thane, in a way, Thane, and some of the other characters, because I, I mean, the big joke on the Bioware forums is the females definitely did, like, regardless of your sexuality, the females tend to have a little bit of the short end of the stick when it came to romances in Mass Effect 3. Yeah. What are your thoughts on yeah. on, on that? Because I never actually saw, at, until you brought it up, I never actually saw it as more of a a learning experience, a li life lessons learning experience, because... Maybe that is a good thing, that, <laughs> because I feel like... <laughs> Girls don't experience rejection as much as guys do. Like, oh. okay, that might be sexist, but <laughs> just from like my experience, like, I don't know. I know I'm gonna get hit by some. <laughs> I'm gonna get punched in the face. Like, straight woman everywhere, just gonna punch me in the face. No. So, um. Okay. Well, you do have well, Kate and romance. That romance works out. Mm -hmm. Um. I've romanced every character in Mass Effect pretty much, except for Jacob and Miranda. Okay. Because I don't really like them. Okay. Um. But fair enough. I yeah, I never really thought about that. The fact that like there are multiple romances that just don't work out yeah, for the ladies. For the ladies. And, and some people actually want there I to be more. I feel like for my straight sisters now. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> no, and but want. at the same time, sometimes you pretty girls just need to know what it's like to get rejected. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> what were you gonna say, Jonathan? They're here and they're there. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, if you go on some forums, actually, for games that are in progress, you will find people who actually sit there and say, you know what, I want more romances that end badly, or more that are, like, a, a vaguely abusive. I mean, people want variety in this stuff. I mean, I guess Mass Effect was sort of just an unfortunate example of no one seeing the variety coming. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's all sorts of arguments for and against. I mean, in certain cases, definitely against. Yeah. But, I mean, it's... That's an interesting point, though, like, appealing to a straight female audience. Like, that is an audience in gaming. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah. ever, you know, it's weird, like, since I've done videos on The Last of Us, my female audience has, like, significantly gained because a lot of women love that game. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of straight women love that game. Mm -hmm. And, like, the, I think that's the thing that, like, Naughty Dog's kind of realized that they have this huge female audience, but a lot of games don't really realize that. But, like, realizing that can be a powerful thing. That's very And it's funny because Naughty Dog actually apparently did not ask for female test players whenever they were testing The Last of Us. It became that's a huge weird. That is weird. Yeah, controversy. And yet, of course, they ended up, you know, and they did end up Especially... with just, you know, sitting there saying, oh, they're not going to, I mean, sitting there saying they're not going to like it, so we really shouldn't even bother, you know. It usually can huh. work out the exact same way. Yeah, I find that really surprising because Ellie is is definitely one of the one of the greatest or strongest female characters like in this decade, I think. Um I mean there's there's been a huge flux of of heroines and female it's very strong female characters in video yeah. games, which I love, oh, and they're not—they're not, yeah, they're not yeah, and they're not over sexualized either. I mean, to, like Lara Croft, even like in the recent Tomb Raider games, they actually made her less sexualized in in yeah. these games, which and I really, especially for all women out there, like really happy that they're that that you know developers are waking up and doing that more in games. Yeah, fist pumps up. <laughs> <laughs> So, oh wow! Don't hit, don't hurt, don't hate me, straight woman. <laughs> <laughs> I got so much hate for like saying that uh, Ellie wasn't bi curious because, like, I think a lot of bi curious girls kind of hated me for that. Uh, um, but <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, it happens. I yeah, I mean, you but, um, I think that's another thing too. Is like, how does how do games deal with like bi curiousness? Like, how do they deal with different levels of the spectrum, but that can be something we can talk about later on. Oh, Caden, Caden from Mass Effect is a great example yeah. of that. You have all kinds of reactions to him suddenly being made. Well, it's hard to say what exactly he was made 
But you know, it, you you'll get There's very the whole opinions. between uh, yeah, Bioware games. It's hard to not talk about Bioware games. It comes to romances, but between Caden, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna Bioware. Uh, you know, we're gonna eat that stuff up. So, between that's what. We're yeah, between between Caden and Mass Effect and Anders in Dragon Age Two, both of these characters, a lot of people claimed became gay or became bisexual. Yeah, and uh, I always say that that always bothered me because I, in in real life, speaking from from um from personal experience, I know people who started out dating women and even considered themselves or at least claimed to their friends that they were straight. Only to later yeah. on realize that they were either a bisexual or b actually completely gay and not really interested in women when they got older. In fact, both my previous boyfriend and my current boyfriend now were both people who identified as straight, like in high school and then in college or after college, they are now completely, I mean, completely gay according to them. So yeah. the whole idea of I, that's why I always. It was a pet peeve of mine whenever I saw people complaining that, oh my gosh, that doesn't happen. Why is Caden all of a sudden gay or bisexual? Why is Anders all of a sudden gay or bisexual? Like, it, it happens. Well, can, can I just say, I love, like, I watch scenes from the Caden gay romance, yes. and he, like, talks about it. He's yes. like, you know, people think, you, have you ever seen me with anyone? You, you may think that I'm just picky or choosy, but maybe I was just looking for someone that, yeah. I, I forget, I think he said that I respected yes. or looked up uh. to, and, uh, and like that, like, he didn't mention gender at all. Yes. Enough. And like, uh. for all well, I know, he could be well, pansexual, you know, yeah. like, but what's great is that, like, you know, I don't know, I felt like that explained everything. Yeah. You know, he I will was say that Kate can handle better than Anders. I mean, certainly the yes. two are in kind of the the kind of the same feel when it comes to whether or not people are buying the sudden change. It depends on your beliefs about sexuality. You know, obviously, I think it can be agreed that it can be fluid, but obviously we haven't gotten to the point where that's a widely um, a widely accepted um, belief. Um, and so, a lot, of course, a lot of it is also due to convenience. We really can't yeah. gloss over or that, that the reason that Anders was made bisexual and that Caden were made bisexual was not necessarily because Bioware really envisioned them like that. It may be more to accommodate and whatnot. So there's, you know, there's a school of thought that goes like that, too, and I think that's pretty understandable. And well, if I were... Caden was meant to be bisexual, actually. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, actually, I do know that. Yeah. Um, I do know that, and that's, and that's cool to find out because, you know, it, it does make more sense. Whereas... Anders, I can see why people find it a little bit harder to chew, you know, just for any yeah. particular reasons. I was just curious what your guys' opinion was of the argument that um, when they came out with Dragon Age 2, for example, uh, and they were talking about the romance options, uh, there was a big controversy or a big debate over their decision to make every single character that was romanceable bisexual. People were saying, oh, that's not realistic at all, you know, why why did you guys do that? And other people were like, well, it's it, it makes things equal. Everybody has an equal share. Like, what are your what are your thoughts on the realism versus the equality? See, what does complicate that a little bit is then they turned around and made someone in particular not bisexual. Yeah. And I have my own theories as to why that is. And I can't say they're really complimentary um, to Bioware on that, but, you know, that's something altogether mm -hmm. whatnot. Um, and certainly, you know, you when it comes to something like this, and this is getting into talk of romantic balancing when it comes to romance options, which, as I do very much believe, can basically be considered an art form in and of itself mm -hmm. to have a lot to think about when it comes to really trying to achieve a good balance of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and Bioware, to a certain extent, learned from Dragon Age Origins that people were... A, we're getting to the point where they didn't necessarily think it was necessary to just have to just have a, an option given to the minority and then just letting them have that while everyone else had more than one. They, yeah, yes. had more than one choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course, what that boils down to, I mean, I, you know, because feasibly you could do it to where one straight and two are bisexual, but for conservation's sake, it just makes more sense to make everyone bisexual. Mm -hmm. on a purely um, 
on a purely game-based level, trying to get it done, et cetera. And so there's a lot that goes into that kind of consideration, want that being one of them. Yeah. And that's part of the reason they made everyone bisexual was, was for simplicity's sake to a certain degree and also to allow, um, to allow full equality or at least almost full equality without having to go to too much more trouble to to further clutter up, let's be honest, the already very short schedule they've had mm -hmm. um, for more than one. And, you know, that's a whole other That's another argument entirely, right yes. That's a whole other discussion right there. Um, but, and so you've got that um, model, and I'm going to start referring to these, you know, since we're getting into the topic. You've got that model, which is everyone is bisexual, everyone can pretty much romance whoever they want, no one's really going to get turned down because they're a certain gender, mm. except for Sebastian. But, you know, that's that. Um, and then you've got the other model, which is now what it looks like they are currently adopting. And a model that I actually am very fond of, even though it's more difficult to pull off, where you've got a certain number of gay characters and an equal number of straight and lesbian characters of either gender. Mm -hmm. And that's a very good model because it allows for diversity, full diversity. It allows for realism. And it allows for um, just options in general. I mean, of course, some people are still going to be disappointed with that model. Yeah. Um, and, of course, some people are, you know, going to boo and cry over either of them. Both models have their obvious advantages and disadvantages, mm -hmm. and will we'll lean towards either one as being the correct one. I think it's actually kind of cool that Bioware is, at the very least, going to get to where they try out both, because they are basically the most balanced, um, the most balanced um, model you can get for romantic options in any video. Um, and this is something that I learned um, not necessarily through AAA titles so much, although AAA titles are starting to adopt these models more, is that actually you'll find that a lot of text-based um, games like Bioware games that have romantic elements put into them but just don't have the flashy graphics and music mm -hmm. go along with the story. And those tend to have a lot more romance options because they're, you know, you, you only have to write them, you don't have to animate them and such. Right. And those tend to have more balance um, because they can appeal to one audience or the other easily than maybe you could argue a AAA game might. Um, so, I mean, I don't really have much of an opinion on how Dragon Age 2 handled the bisexuality thing. I will say that I maybe am in the school of thought that every, absolutely everyone being bisexual, I mean, I'm in the same school of thought as everyone being romanceable would be kind of, uh, um, that I might not necessarily recommend that. You know, because implications are implications. Sometimes you don't necessarily want to send the wrong ones um, when you are designing something people get so invested in. Um, but I don't have much of an opinion, um, a negative opinion of it on that, except for the fact that I did notice that they did kind of make a 180 with Sebastian for a few different reasons. Um, and, you know, we might get into that later, or we can talk about it now. I mean, you know, our structure isn't really holding up at this point. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whatever flows. Yeah. Kathleen, do you, did you have an opinion yeah. on that? Yeah, I I really respect what you um, just said about structure and the kind of the limits when it comes to creating video games. Um, but I will say that I do not like the model of Dragon Age 2. I think that one thing that you really have to be careful with as a developer or as a writer when it comes to bisexual characters is bisexual people have so many stereotypes that they have to fight on a daily basis. Mm. And one of those stereotypes stereotypes is that they are more promiscuous than any other like mm. sexual preference yeah. um, because they have the potential to like men and women right. or anyone in between um, and so uh, but like the thing is bisexuality means so many different things for so many different people True. it's not always like a 50 50 thing for everyone mm -hmm. and um, you know there's totally preference and all these other things that come into play um, and I think that's one thing that I don't think many games really delve into that, that personal struggle that bisexual people have to face. Um, you know, I think, especially, I, I'd love to hear what you guys say about this, but, like, I know that there's a big um, prejudice in the gay community towards bisexual people. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know a lot of gay guys that say that they will never date a bisexual man because they find it disgusting that they date women. I have only ever dated bisexual and pansexual women. And I've gotten a lot of comments from my friends about that. Um, 
about how I should be on my guard because they might leave me for a man, which has never happened, mm -hmm. um, you know, and stuff like that. And, you know, I usually get shocked responses from my friends. They're like, why would you date someone that's bi? Like, they like they dated men, and that's gross. And um, so, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, dealing with that and the fact that, like, even in the gay community, there's prejudice mm -hmm. against that. You're absolutely right on that. That's, you know, that's airing more toward real-world stuff, but this actually does have application in this as well, because, I mean, what you said when you brought this up is that, really, I mean, games are still evolving when it comes to how they portray bisexual characters. I mean, goodness yeah. knows, um, Bioware is still having maybe some trouble here and there about not making bisexuals seem like, you know, they'll just absolutely go for anything, mm -hmm. and they don't really have, you know, standards or anything like that. I mean, you got Zebra, and you've got Leliana, you've got Liara, all of whom... I mean, well, Jan is a little different um, for a couple of reasons. So they they've explored it some for a couple of reasons. Um, but in general, yes, they are still having trouble making bisexual characters that are more that seem more like they weren't just written to be bisexual mm -hmm. in the sense of that. Um, and I mean, of course, some of that comes from bisexuality actually being a huge convenience for people who want to do Bioware style games with romance because you know. You know, the, the appeal to the all bisexual model, again, is that you technically have to do less work while allowing for complete equality if you do it right. Um, so, so it's, it's complicated um, in, in, in some regards, but um, I think that as, at least in video games you'll see that start to wane a little bit here and there. There have already been some examples that have, that have gone to a better you know, a higher plane of existence when it comes to actually being treated like people and not necessarily like an orientation. I mean, you know, that goes for all orientations to a certain regard. Um, and so, yeah, so I guess I'm still a little bit impartial on it. But, I mean, what you absolutely say about real life is, is pertinent, and it also does apply to um, video games, just as a lot of things in real life apply to video games. I mean, most of the things that we are going to talk about are a result of what has happened in real life. And because our our people, um, our personalities and stuff, they transfer to characters um, on a global scale, I guess you could say. I think, Kathleen, that in our society today, it's very challenging for many straight people as well as completely gay or completely lesbian people to fully understand bisexuality because like i i struggle because for my entire life i've only been attracted to men i've never been attracted to both genders and same goes for straight people and um and it's even even more challenging for people to understand uh the transgendered spectrum or the queer uh, spectrum or the pansexual spectrum which is very unfortunate i mean i even uh, feel like there's so much more that I can learn. I feel very naive when it comes to transgendered people because uh, I unfortunately don't, as far as I know, don't know enough people in that category. And therefore, because of that, I think it's easier for uh, society and in video games as an extension to just mis to just misunderstand them and sometimes portray them in a negative light. I, I sometimes wish that, what I do agree with you, especially in Dragon Age 2, Kathleen, is that you have these characters that are bisexual, but you don't really, for better or worse, and maybe this is a completely different topic to debate, uh, none of the LGBTQ characters in video games really talk about some of the personal issues that, or, that they deal with as members of the LGBTQ community, like what is it about bisexuals that makes that, what is it about their experiences that makes them unique as a compared to straight people or, or, or gay people, so you know, they don't, the world that is. yeah, we don't really, we don't really delve deep into the psyche of, of a homosexual character or a, the psyche of a homosexual female, and I guess a lot of people make can argue that if it has nothing to do with the story, if it has nothing to do with the plot, then it's not really worth mentioning. Um, mm -hmm. And I can understand that too, because you know there's only so many dialogue they can pack into, you know, pack into a script. Uh, so, but I think that uh, you know, and I, 
And I guess you don't want a video game to all of a sudden be somebody's so personal soapbox either. I think Gone Home did a good job of kind of delving into that though, yes. without getting too political. You know, yes. they did talk about some really political things, like um, uh, they talked a lot about um, "Don't Ask, Don't Tell." That was yeah. kind of a big thing, um, and that's a really you know touchy subject, I guess. Like yeah. political, I guess you could say, even though it shouldn't be. Um, but yeah, they they delved into I some loved, things with that game. That's what I loved about Gone Home because even though even though I'm a gay male. It was really neat to experience um, the realization of a lesbian female. I think is it. I think it's it's very different for a lesbian female. To ex- the experience of the lesbian female is is in in many ways different from the experiences of a gay male, and especially because of the time period, the setting of that game was in the '90s, and I grew up in the '90s, pretty much along the same age as Sam. Like I, the things she was going through in a way I was going through as well as yeah. a gay male. And that game, I mean, I'm sure that game affected you very, very personally and very deeply, Kathleen. And it definitely did the same thing for me just because like there were so many situations and so many feelings that Sam talked about in her diaries that I'm like, I was there. I, I'm with you. I've been there. I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. So, uh, and I guess a game, a video game before that never really allowed me to experience and put myself in the shoes of what it actually feels like to be a member of the LGBT community. And I hope that for a lot of straight people who play the game, it gives them a different perspective of, you know, a, a different perspective on, on, on that, on LGBT people and what they have had to yeah. go through that most straight people don't go through in their lives, at least in that way. So. Yeah, and part of the problem is, as was mentioned earlier, part of the problem is, is the tendency to maybe go into kind of a soapbox mode with it. Yeah. And, there, and, you know, again, there's multiple schools of thought with this because there are some people who, who you know, who would argue that really setting a, say, going so deeply into personal experiences that no one else knows maybe isn't the best way of making us seem normal. And, you know, then you have other people who say, well, absolutely, we need to address those things so that the other people know about them, and so then they start treating us more normal. There's, you know, it's a little complicated. I do I do appreciate what Gone Home did for that and whatnot. Um, and, and, you know, what I was saying before is that some of it can also depend on the world that the game is set in and what they're trying yeah. to do with it, with the topic. Because in the, in the world of Bioware, you don't tend to, for one reason or another, you don't tend to see um, the stigma against, um, you know, homosexuality or other kinds of maybe mm-hmm. relatable fights, if you want to call it that, um, because they don't want to create a world of escape where people go and then experience some of the same things they experience in their real mm-hmm. life. So to assert that's part of the reason. Um, and, you know, again, you know, the soapboxing thing. I mean, I, I believe Dave, David Guider, um, the lead writer for Dragon Age, mm-hmm. is gay. He has actually mentioned on his Tumblr I never knew that, that he could have passed away. Huh? You didn't I know did that? I did not know that. Had no idea. I believe so. Yeah. I'm have to check David that. Guider is actually himself. Um, wow. And that would probably surprise a lot of people because, and part of the reason is because he sits there and he says, well, the truth is I could have had some, maybe some more sway to make things more progressive, but then on the other hand, that would be me impressing that onto the game, my experience mm. and whatnot. And that's not necessarily practical for the game itself, mm-hmm. first of all. And because it might, you know, it would sort of bias it maybe a little bit. And, you know, because they have other considerations to worry about, obviously, mm-hmm. when it comes to that. And, you know, those go into some of the reasons why gaming has not been more progressive over time and whatnot. Um, and, and I really hope I'm correct, because I know that I saw that on somewhere. I huh. that he does say he himself was gay, and he talked about being a gay developer um, of, in a video game world where it's still kind of finding its way around when it comes to um, homosexuality and the like. Um, so, I mean, you know, so that's just an example of, you know, someone who can try to do it, certainly, but, you know, there's other things that have to be taken into consideration, I um, mean, you don't want to, and you don't want it to just get too soapboxy and etc. and, you know, obviously this is, you know, there are people who will absolutely disagree with that. There are some people who agree more with it. Mm-hmm. It's that's something that society itself is still working. Um, 
And I do agree that having some instances that explore that is, would be great and everything. Um, but some people will argue that normalcy, making us seem more normal, and that making us seem like we don't really deal with those problems to as great of a degree as some people, as some media portrays. Because I mean, if you watch gay films, of course, almost half of the time, at the very least, it revolves entirely around the sexuality mm -hmm. and the problems involved. Right. And some people sit there and say, why can't they just love each other? Why can't things kind of end happily? You know, um, you know so schools of thought are different, um, and it's just one of those things that is going to come to a head maybe at some point, but that, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of questioning and debating on. One, we're going to say something, Kathleen? Well, well, I mean, you can say your point first. Uh, well, I, um, before we leave the topic of, of Gone Home, because one of the things that I loved about Gone Home, especially once I finished playing the game, is that when you read descriptions of the game, for example, like on Steam, and even in virtually every single review that I've read, um, advertise, or talking about the game or encouraging other people to play, is that they never once, as that far as I've noticed in most articles never once mentioned this is the story about a, a gay sister having a gay about a gay sister or this is a story about heter uh, homosexuality you 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 i think for most people you discover that while you're playing the game and uh i love that because you know that they didn't advertise it as a homosexual themed game as they would get preaching to the choir yeah, yeah. You want people to go into it sort of ready in a way to be, mm -hmm. you know, to have their being questioned or influenced or whatnot. Yeah, and I wonder. I'm, and so, yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if that was a if I, if that was a purposeful decision. If that was that if that was completely done on purpose. Hmm. Yeah, maybe you could. You know, you could argue that either it was to it was to preserve the fact that the, the surprise. You know, if you want to call it a surprise, that it was about it had homosexual themes, or you could also argue that it was because they didn't want to mention it at all. But either way, it's good. Um, you know, yeah, it's it depends the same purpose. You know, you when it comes to video games, sometimes it's hard to tell when what their exact intention was when it comes to either censorship or lack thereof or whatnot. Um, yeah. It would be really, and that's it'd be really. That's just how. It it would be really cool for us to reach a point where something like that isn't really a twist anymore or isn't really a big surprise. They're like, oh, okay, well, she ends up liking this girl. I mean, that's, oh. you know, it's not it's not really a, a, a big shock. It's just this is a love story, and that's really all it is, you know. Well, do you guys kind of want to talk about, um, well, there's something, you know, Hark brought up about the different experiences that... Um, for gay men and lesbian women. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really interesting thing. Um, especially in games. I think in game culture, is that something that like we could start talking about? Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, one thing I realize is that when it comes to game culture, there's individual like struggles that gay men go through because there's this this stereotype that like gaming culture is more for like the masculine male and if you're um, gay, you're not really, you don't conform to what culture thinks is masculine, mm -hmm. even though I know some really masculine <laughs> gay dudes, so um, yeah, exactly. they're more masculine than any straight dude I've ever met, nice. so I don't know why that stereotype exists, but I think um, it's different, I think, for lesbian women, le lesbian woman is that I think you tend to be more accepted in the gaming community if you're an attractive um, feminine lesbian mm -hmm. um, and if you t more typically if you're like a bisexual um, woman which is really unfair to the bisexual woman out there that's the kind of thing that's so up by real life yeah 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 um, you know I I've gotten you know not that I try to you know pay too much attention to the hate but I usually get a lot of sexual harassment about the fact that I don't like men and you oh. know get all these comments even in real life about oh I'm sure it, you'll get over it and you'll go back to men eventually <laughs> and I think that's partly like from being feminine um, but I don't see gay men getting that a lot from like straight women being like oh you're gonna come around eventually and like woman again yeah you know? like that's, not, that's interesting it's not really a um, 
common thing you'll hear for gay men, because most of the time people don't doubt that gay men are really gay, but a lot of times hmm. people doubt when a feminine woman is gay. Very different And that's, that goes for games, too. I mean, you know, a lot of people really are fighting for the idea that Ellie might be straight, but if two dudes made out in a video that, game, yeah. everyone would be like, yeah, that's gay. Yes, so. that that uh, is yeah. really cool, because I've definitely seen video comments games, like that. They, a gay man and lesbian women very differently, actually, and bisexuals thereof. Yeah. Um, yeah. In a lot of different ways. 